So, Teresa, I thought we'd start first with a bit more of a background on what you're doing in the investment space currently and a bit of your journey uh, into the space. Sure. So, it's an honor to be here. It's great to be chatting with you, Ori. So, I have been investing in early stage uh, software technology companies since uh, 1999, so the last millennium, as I like to tell the younger investors on my team. Um, so for 15 years, I was at a larger global venture capital firm uh, called Axel Partners, where I was a managing partner. And then five years ago, I co-founded my own firm, Aspect Ventures. We focus on early stage, so Series A, first institutional investment capital uh, in the range of five to $10 million at that round. Uh, and invest in companies in the software sector um, in many different areas, anything software oriented from cybersecurity to digital health to enterprise SaaS and even some consumer software companies. Uh, and we invest in those companies and typically stay on the board of directors for eight to 10 years or more uh, until the companies go public. Um, I had one of my cybersecurity companies go public last year uh, after being on the board for 16 years since wow. their Series A. So. That one had a little longer gestation period, but it's doing great. It's a multi-billion dollar cybersecurity public company now. It was a billion dollar exit, you should add. So it, well done. It was. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll come back because there are a series of firsts. And maybe when we talk about diversity and what that begins to look like, uh, we can come back to a bit more detail about your journey. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And or I know you uh, have actually been a technology founder as well as now a technology investor. So maybe you could share with us the, the journey from being a tech founder to a tech investor. Sure, so I'm actually a recovering lawyer, uh, <laughs> which you should add. And I think my first, my brief career uh, as a lawyer was I was hired by YPO, uh, Paul Lamontagne, uh, when I was in Johannesburg and trying to figure out uh, what the hell I was gonna do with my life after moving here to join my now husband. Um, fairly quickly moved on into co-founding two organizations, one Zalendo, I wear an activist hat, uh, some of you might know that, very interested in governance challenges, and Ushahidi, which some of you might know, that became a global crowdsourcing platform. Um, ran it for almost three years, um, got burnt out, because it's quite frenetic. Um, and I had two young kids at the time and uh, wanted to do something different and it was a bit, I think some of the lessons that I had learned as a founder when you're sort of building on the fly and making lots of mistakes felt that I needed to go back to a more structured organization and learn and Google had been trying to recruit me for a while. Uh, so I joined Google as their first head of policy and strategy for Africa. Um, did that, loved it, covered 12 markets. Uh, and then found myself living in airports uh, <laughs> for most of my time, but also um, learned a lot about what the opportunities and the gaps were in the tech space and then moved on to investing to begin to address some of those gaps. I think also found very few people who look like me um, in the investment space in Africa. So there were a lot of non-Africans driving where tech dollars were going and they were all coming to pick my brain on where they should invest in Africa. And I was like, wait a minute, something's wrong with this picture. Uh, so I figured I could learn and help sort of balance out what um, early stage investing begins to look like in Africa. And that's how I ended up at Omidia Network. And I now also advise lots of early stage um, startups as well. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about uh, current trends, I think, and I want you to address two things. What are the hot areas that you're seeing in tech in Silicon Valley? But there's also been a fairly big backlash um, for tech and platforms and questioning um, the role of technology is not as optimistic as it was uh, a few years ago. So can you address those two? Sure. So um, in terms of uh, big tech trends, so I'm going to end with one which leads into sort of part of the backlash. So cybersecurity uh, has suddenly become very hot. I actually literally just came from RSA conference in San Francisco where I spoke then 30 or so hours on a plane and then here. Um, and that's uh, when I first started investing in cybersecurity in the late 90s, it was a much smaller conference. I think this year there were 70,000 attendees. Wow. 
Um, it's obviously anybody who reads a newspaper in the news now, even if it's not really your area of focus, if you're a leader in any type of company, all potential companies now are targets. It used to just be if you were in a regulated industry like finance, that was an area of interest. And so uh, cybersecurity has become the second or third largest uh, area of venture capital dollar investments over the last several years, reaching uh, anywhere between three to $5 billion per annum in the US only, which is a little over 10% uh, of the venture dollars. Uh, Another area, which I know we've talked about a little bit, which was very hot last year uh, and is becoming less so this year, is um, blockchain and uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, I actually still think that there's really interesting potential for blockchain as an infrastructure sort of protocol layer. I think most of the cryptocurrencies and certainly most of the ICOs are highly speculative and not really an area that my firm is investing in. But in terms of infrastructure, there are a few things, especially where it crosses over from blockchain into things like identity and security. And of course, everything now is AI and ML enabled. Uh, and that plays across all the sectors from things you would think about, like using machine learning to help improve uh, cybersecurity a threat identification more quickly, as well as using AI and computer vision to help with uh, in digital health with uh, reading of um, radiology and MRI report MRIs, um, but also even to using machine learning for uh, enterprise use cases that are perhaps more mundane. I've seen some companies that are using machine learning to improve the accounts receivable collection process. So everything from classic business process to more high-end. One area where I think, uh, again, another one that was hot a little bit ago, but I think has fallen off a little bit because it's taking longer than people think, actually two that both have to do with computer vision. So one is sort of uh, full AR. So there's uses for um, assisted uh, reality, but not the full virtual reality. And similarly, I think there continue to be investments in autonomous vehicle software and hardware, but uh, with the exception potentially of Mr. Musk, most people who are in the space say that fully autonomous or level five is many years off. Mm. Turning both from that perspective where there's been some pretty clear backlashes, um, but also the question of what's what, what, what does it mean when we are starting to use machine learning in all facets of technology, both in everything from potential uh, labor displacement and job shifting, as well as something you mentioned before, Ori, the potential bias yeah. when you're not including in the data sets or unfortunately in the researchers, right, where only uh, between 25 and 30% of uh, computer science graduates in the United States are female, unfortunately single digit percentage uh, of uh, underrepresented minorities uh, in that. And so there's unconscious inherent bias in the data set, right? A ML is only as good, it's not just the algorithms, but it's the data that goes in. And then of course, it's the people who write the algorithms. Yeah. So you have potentially two layers of, uh, of unconscious bias in there. And then I think lastly, uh, a lot's been written, and I think it's true and something incumbent on all leaders to be thinking about, uh, which is just clearly technology has been a huge force in driving uh, the US and global economy. The five, the five largest US public companies are all companies that received venture capital financing. Mm. Uh, and they've all wow. become the five largest companies, everybody from Apple and Amazon and so on. Um, but unlike other industrial revolutions, uh, the, the, the sharing of that wealth creation has been relatively concentrated to a small percentage of not only the employees, but even not just all the employees. So if you take everything from, you hear the story about back in the days of IBM, obviously a, a first gen technology company, where all the employees were part of the company and they all had stock options and shared in the upside. These days, companies increasingly outsource all non-critical functions, which includes everything from office staff to janitorial staff. And so you don't see the stories like, like you read in the New York Times about the woman who was on the janitorial staff and rose to become vice president of human resources at IBM. Yeah. 
So I think there are a lot of things to think about with regards to not only the potential impact of technology on people as consumers, but also how do we think about that in terms of potentially broadening our employee bases uh, and, and, the, and serving, you know, we have multiple stakeholders. We obviously have the employees, we have the shareholders, but I think we also have customer and community stakeholders that we all need to be thinking about as leaders as well. Great, and, and I think how that also looks like in a global world, um, because we're beginning to see challenges, uh, one around AI, two around how Facebook is being used in different parts of the world, um, and in a, you're making money from a global business, but are you wearing a global lens then in terms of thinking about the, the implications? Um, I think when I look at our region, some of the trends I think are similar. Uh, cybersecurity, I think, is going to grow to be a huge uh, opportunity here. Uh, if I look at Kenya in the headlines today, mm. banks are being hacked. Uh, I think it's showing up mostly in finance, but it will extend. Um, in a, a market that's very mobile, money driven, yeah. uh, especially as well. You're finding telcos beginning to think about security on their end. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of folk interest in last mile solutions. And by last mile, I don't think, uh, not necessarily like electricity and all of that, logistics. So we've uh, invested in a company called Twiga that presents as an agriculture based um, company, but is really a last mile company. They're figuring out how to get to farmers uh, and bigger markets and bridge the inefficiencies. Uh, in FinTech, we're also seeing um, companies falling up on payments, mm -hmm. but last mile. So Paystack is a great company in Nigeria that's opening up the potential of how do you enable SMEs to sell online, offline, and sort of short circuit the banks. Um, I think there's increasing opportunity in health. Um, particularly on primary health care and delivering health solutions virtually. Uh, we heard about Zipline, I think, yesterday. Uh, blood delivery, uh, solving problems. I think it breaks my heart sometimes that the great opportunities are solving for public inefficiencies. Uh, so broken governments uh, or broken public systems are forcing people to come up with private solutions, whether it's in health and education, uh, electricity, big investments in solar, uh, but sometimes as a reflection of a very broken underlying public system. And so, you know, coming up with private solutions is great, but I, I don't know how sustainable that is. Um, I think the last opportunity is probably around, we hear about jobs a lot, the big, huge unemployment problem, fears about AI, robotics, and whether Africa is falling even further behind. Uh, but really thinking about talent and skill and matching people to opportunities, you're beginning to see here less AI, more machine learning around recruiting, um, around making, preparing students in particular to be better ready for the job market and getting employ employers to think about recruiting um, very differently, I think are some of the big trends. Um, as far as backlash, I think, well, not, maybe not backlash, but there's a lot of hype in the early stage um, investment space. And it was very focused on mobile, so M this, M that, everyone trying to build the next M PESA. Um, but realizing that we have a big Africa is not a country problem. And, and so it's very hard for businesses to scale uh, in the same way as, let's say, in the US or in India, where you have a billion sort of people market. Um, I think there are challenges also around currency fluctuations. Nigeria got hit pretty badly in the last two years, where a lot of startups had to uh, lose their valuations because of currency inefficiencies. And I think the sort of this question of, of chicken and egg, like, should we be thinking? ahead on the new wave or, or trying to address uh, brick and mortar questions. Um, I think in terms of AI, what we're seeing is Africa being used as a data point. So China is investing very heavily in surveillance. Um, so for those of you tracking who are away and what they're doing, basically they're using a lot of this facial recognition. They're refining their facial recognition software and databases in Africa with very little oversight. And so really worried about what that begins to look like um, for us in, in, in the long run. 
So how are they getting access to that information? Are there, is there a lot of investment by China into Africa, technology companies and technology startups? Yes. Um, well, not necessarily. They're doing a lot of government to government deals. Mm. Um, so either running CCTV wiring, I think you are seeing um, or, or partnering with mobile uh, phone companies to provide their underlying technology. You are seeing, though, um, Jack Ma has been to Africa, I think, twice now. He's starting to think about investing in African startups. Uh, he's started a great program where he's taking every year uh, founders to do sort of an intense 10-day, uh, 15-day uh, tour of all the Alibaba businesses, seeing how they work, scaling. So that certainly the it's become a lot more nuanced. It's not just about sucking up what we're offering, but also beginning to bring back and see the opportunity. You're seeing Tencent um, move into payments, which I think is really interesting. Uh, Transition, some of you might not have heard of them. They're now the second largest phone company in Africa after Samsung. And their hack was basically they built a camera that could recognize black skin. And so your selfies actually look fantastic on a transition phone. <laughs> and, that, and that's why they sell, is because they have great camera. You know, talk about sort of how invisible sometimes we play out in tech and the biases in terms of lighting and, and, and good cameras. And so if it's a young demographic, everyone wants the nice looking selfie with a phone that's not $800, uh, transition has cracked that market mm. and doing really well and now starting to build a whole ecosystem based on their, on, their, on their handset alone, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. So, Ori, a couple of things. So one is, I, I don't want to come off as the person from Silicon Valley who thinks that all technology comes from there, because I think you brought up a few really interesting areas where I believe uh, Africa and other uh, regions could very well lead. So you talked about agri agricultural technology, uh, as well as, I think, in terms of certain other areas with mobile payments. So to me, the opportunity for in fintech, broadly speaking, is similar to what I remember seeing with emergence of sort of 3G, right, sort of 2G even, where because, say in Africa, there, were, there was no legacy landline provider or very little of that, people were actually able to go in, build wireless technology, and be far advanced in terms of data capabilities versus what we had in the United States, and I would argue instead of what we have today. Mm -hmm. And some of the mobile payment startups that I've seen coming out of Africa are far more innovative uh, because they don't have as much of the legacy financial infrastructure, and this can be good or bad, being a former lawyer, regulations that we have you know, in the United States and in, in Western Europe. Um, maybe you could give a sense for how large, roughly, is the venture capital, you know, private company tech investment market in Africa or, or some of the larger countries, obviously. Sure. That I believe Kenya probably gets the most, but you could give a sense just, and to give context in terms of in the United States, it's about two to three hundred billion fluctuates per annum in terms of uh, private dollars into venture-backed companies per annum. So we're, one of the things we struggle with is really good data because some companies don't report they raise, but they don't report, so you're relying a lot on press release. But it's estimated, I think over the last five to six years, we've seen about $600 million come in, uh, which is a big shift, but still nowhere near the US standards into early stage tech investing. Um, very concentrated in South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria and even then very concentrated on fintech and solar. So there's still a long way to go in terms of diversification, both regional, um, in terms of francophone in particular, is very underinvested in, and sectors. Um, we are seeing in the last two years or three years, um, particularly last year, three or four big funds have been raised. Um, the most recent was Partec. Uh, with a Senegalese and Cameroonian co-founder, they've raised $100 million uh, to invest very heavily backed by IFC, L'Oreal, uh, a number of big European companies, and I think that's great because what we need is not just the dollars, but also the networks and the business support and the acceleration that comes in with that. Um, but still a long way to go growing. We're also seeing uh, the emergence of local venture funds, which is my other big beef, 
is that you know, a lot of wealthy Africans are very heavily invested in brick and mortar businesses. So real estate, malls, hotels, uh, and to get them to begin to explore this new space is very, very difficult. Um, so, you know, I work, my fund is by an American billionaire, Piero Media. I'm like, when will Aliko Dangote, you know, write some checks to local startups? Uh, when do we begin to see local money seeding local startups, I think is a huge gap in opportunity. What you're seeing though is, is entrepreneurs are starting to do that themselves. Uh, so a lot of the early, the entrepreneurs are about like in Series C and so on are starting their own funds. So I think Nigeria now has nine uh, local, locally raised and locally backed funds, which I think is, is, is great. And we're hoping to see more local funds and angels filling up that space. Yeah. Well, when you, when you start to see sort of entrepreneurs becoming angel investors and then maybe also becoming professional sort of uh, venture investors, that's always what I think of as sort of st part of the positive flywheel that you start to see. So it's really interesting that you're starting to see that um, in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. Similarly, you know, um, people often ask me, and I'm yeah. sure you too, about sort of, you know, why, why is it that um, whatever number you're looking at, less than 10% of venture capital investors in the United States are female, and also that uh, less than 4% of the venture capital dollars, it's higher as a percentage of companies, but as a percentage of dollars, go to women. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, my fund invests, as I said, in those sectors, at those stages, there's nothing particular about us having a gender lens, but um, there is a positive ecosystem that starts to happen. So, um, our, whereas by, by number of companies, it's about 18 or 19 percent of US-backed companies that receive venture capital have a female founder or co-founder. In my, in my fund, which we're now investing out of our second fund, uh, it's about 42 percent. How uh, did you get there? Which also happens to represent the pipeline. Yeah. So, you know, there's nothing about when you ask what we do that I think it's just by, since I'm the co-founder of the fund, <laughs> uh, I maybe have uh, better access yeah. to those uh, entrepreneurs. Um, you know, and yes, I'm even able to find some amazing female founders in cybersecurity companies. Not 40%, I wish it was, but uh, other sectors like digital health and enterprise software uh, tend to be a little bit more balanced. So I think it's just part of, as I see more of these women, and now one of the women that I backed uh, five or uh, seven years ago who had a FinTech company, went public, got, I mean, sorry, got acquired by Northwestern Mutual for several hundred million dollars. Uh, and now she's off and starting her own venture fund. Mm -hmm. So it's one data point along the lines of what you were talking about with the Nigerian entrepreneurs who are going out and starting their own venture fund. So I do believe it starts with finding more diverse entrepreneurs and founders to invest in and help them grow their companies. Some of them will go on and start a second and third and fourth company, which is great. Some of them will choose to do what you did, which is go on to the investing side. Yeah, and what you're also beginning to see is a rethinking of how we do venture in Africa. I think we cut and paste the Silicon Valley model, which is seed, uh, venture, exit, IPO. The reality is exit and IPO opportunities are very, very limited in this market. And how can we begin to rethink how we do venture and early stage funding? A lot of the companies that come to me, for instance, to pitch, you find it's either it's a working capital problem that they're really trying to solve with equity, or they're not able mm -hmm. to access finance um, through banks or affordable debt. Um, or basically, they, they could sort of, they're never going to hit a 10x or 8x or whatever that makes it um, uh, justify sort of taking a listage risk. Or the cost of writing a $200,000 check mm -hmm from an investor side, from DD, structure, legal, uh, domicile. Like I, I, I did an early stage deal in Nigeria that I was so determined to invest locally with local structures. What a nightmare. I think the cost in lawyers alone <laughs> was more than the check or slightly you know, less than the check would have written and would have just done it out of Mauritius. Um, so that's, you know, they talk about there's a big 
early stage investing gap in Africa, let's say sub 500. It costs the same to write a $2 million check as it does to write a 200,000. From a DD against structure, getting the entrepreneurs paperwork together, trying to figure out all of these things. And so what are the instruments, you know, in the US you have safes and s simple instruments for early stage that can be replicated in this market. Um, so you're starting to see some of the entrepreneurs and particularly women um, who are now getting into the African early stage investing space to have conversations around new ways of doing business. Uh, for instance, should we be looking at um, just debt, you know, structured debt? Uh, there's a great fund, Alpha Mundi, out of Europe, uh, that's doing very interesting things with debt structures because if, you know, they're able to get, if you're investing in a revenue positive company, you look at the cash flows, what they really, maybe it's very capital intensive, rather than giving up equity, just give them working capital, you're able to get it at 15%, much higher than what you're getting in Europe from interest rates. You get your money back in two years, or you convert to equity. Um, it's a very interesting model. Um, there's a great VC fund or company in the US called IndyVC, INDI.VC. And what they're looking at is exit to the founders. So after three years, instead of exiting to IPO, why don't you exit to the founders at 3x and maybe retain a bit of equity in the long run, but that way the founders have control of the company back, they, you've helped them along, uh, because we end up seeing, with no data, you're seeing crazy valuations raised in African early stage companies, like just ridiculous. Uh, they try and raise a series B and no one will look at them because you gave up so much equity or your valuation was ridiculous. You figured out your pack, uh, but you're, you're stuck now at uh, fall on raises. I think beginning to address some of these inefficiencies in terms of structure, the checks that we're writing and how we're doing it is also a huge opportunity that I'm hoping some people listening will take on because it's, it's, it's a huge gap and it's making it very, very difficult for local founders in particular to raise. Um, even though they have great ideas and innovative ideas, um, the Silicon Valley model is not translating 100%. The last thing I see that is very damaging is that it then reinforces pattern biases. So you'll see Stanford raising from Stanford uh, in Africa. You see a lot of expatriates raising much easier in Africa than local founders because they don't have, they don't understand the language of Silicon Valley, they don't understand the slick decks, they don't understand this sort of how you, you know, how you pitch basically. Um, or their B2B businesses, not very sexy for impact investing, They're just, a, you know, a solid business that's making money but doesn't fit any bottom of the pyramid, financial inclusion, saving people lens. Um, and so figuring out how to crack that problem, I think, will be important. Yeah, and uh, just following on to that, I think if you look at other, uh, if you look at how things have developed in other areas, like in India or in China, where my prior firm had funds in both of those places, mm -hmm. it's not just getting the early stage um, and the potentially the lack of exits, uh, it's finding that mid-stage capital, right? Series B and C, a lot of times where that has come from in those other geographies is two things. So one is um, the large traditional global 5,000 corporates. Mm. So whether in India, ICICI Bank was actually, they moved all the way back to early stage, but clearly continued in the mid stage. So other financial institutions or certainly many of the conglomerates in India like Reliance and others have filled in both in that mid stage mm. uh, past the super early. So I don't know, you know, that would, that potentially is a well proven path where uh, multinationals or large African corporations, uh, especially some of the large telcos and yeah. financial services have historically played in mid stage, later stage venture capital, as well as, and great to see, obviously you were at the forefront of this with sort of large global tech companies like the Googles and the Facebooks uh, and the Microsofts of the world who do already have 
economic interests and locations on the continent here, uh, not only as sort of late stage capital, but also potentially as uh, acquisition exits, because you're right, the IPO markets are usually one of the last things to really develop, but there are plenty of other uh, alternatives, certainly in terms of global M&A. Maybe just briefly, you could talk about the size of the mobile internet enabled population in South Africa, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, you could just pick those three countries and because it's quite large and especially if you look at the population under say 25 or 30 as compared to the United States or other more developed countries. So the market opportunity here I think is really, unlike other places where startups are still pretty nascent, um, if, take a very different example, I've, a lot of the cybersecurity investments I do are in Israel, and they've got great technology and they've done well, but they've had to figure out how to very quickly find their technology to other markets because their domestic markets are so small. Here I think you have a unique opportunity uh, where you have incredibly large and growing domestic markets. Um, in some countries, yes, but you're finding increasingly, I read an interesting study that's looking at fintech companies, uh, startups in Africa now, are launching almost immediately in multiple African countries. Uh, and much earlier than they would, like if they were in the US or in other parts of the world, because the markets are, they're big, but still small. And, and so with the exception of Nigeria, maybe everyone is now swirling around Ethiopia, uh, that's about 80 million people. Um, you still need to be in multiple countries at the same time uh, to hedge one on sort of addressable market, but also political risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and so learning from other mistakes, um, launching, so you're seeing multiple countries quickly. Uh, you're also seeing a very then clever, um, the advantage that it gives you is that if you can do five countries from the get-go, they're like, okay, so why don't we go to Indonesia? And why don't we go to India? And why don't we go to Asia? And so I'm really excited to see African founders looking at broader markets and not just um, African markets. So looking almost immediately then to go into Southeast Asia, for instance, um, very early on, which I think is, is, is great. Um, and something that, that, you know, I always say the millennials will save us um, in Africa is because they have less fear. Um, the founders that are meeting now, the younger ones, have less fear about new things and new territories and trying, you know, th th their question is always, you know, I'll be like, well, why are you doing this? And their answer will be, why not? Um, <laughs> which is a very sort of different and great philosophy. Uh, I think, you know, there's books about lean startup. You know, the African startup is lean startup by force. Um, if you have to spend $4,000 a month on generator fuel alone, uh, you, you know, it's like you make money or you die. There's no going back to your mother's garage and there's no this family network waiting to save you. Uh, and so the ones that make it through are already pretty resilient from the get-go, uh, which I think is really exciting. And, you know, something we talked about is then how can we bring the best of that to opportunities to scale and to learn from other markets, which I think is missing. We're not learning enough from each other. Um, I think it's great to see why Combinator is taking on more and more African companies into Y Combinator and coming back to learn with them, and I think that's great. So seeing a lot more cross and what Jack Ma is doing with Alibaba, seeing more cross-regional, cross-border, uh, not just what are we learning from Silicon Valley, like what can Silicon Valley learn from us, I think is uh, something we should be thinking about a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so last thing, I think, before we open it up for questions, we talked about, um, you know, this question of, you know, we, we sit on boards, uh, we help founders with boards and founders with teams, and how do we think about diversity and what that means in today's world and why it's so important? Do you want to share anything from your experiences there? Sure. Well, it's, I've seen a really interesting change in, in a positive way where, honestly, when I started in the business 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't really discussed. 
um, to, I would say, a few years ago, people, some of the thought leaders, uh, like I'm sure like many of you, thinking about it, but probably more from the standpoint of it's something we should do. It would be a good corporate citizen, you know, good leadership to, to do this. To literally now, um, especially, especially with uh, the more millennial, younger founders, and then I'm also part of uh, an organization called Founders for Change, where we have had, of their own accord, over a thousand companies um, sign up and say that they are pledging to increase the diversity that's along all dimensions in both their management teams and their boards and their investors. And they are all doing this because they've seen enough of the data, which I'm sure many of you have, which shows that diverse boards uh, perform 22% better on ROE, uh, management teams that have gender diversity, this, this, the next two stats are from McKinsey, uh, perform 26% better, uh, and management teams that are diverse um, in terms of uh, underrepresented groups and backgrounds actually perform 31% better. So if you want to do it, whether it's sort of supposed to be a good thing to do, but what's really exciting to me now is we have seen a groundswell change with the startups anyway, and hopefully that will bleed forward uh, into they want to do this because they, they've seen the numbers, and frankly, because talent is the heart, I'm sure all of your CEOs say, I, no matter where they are, I can tell you, all the CEOs, every single board meeting is like, I can't hire enough great software developers, engineers, salespeople, mark, any, any function, it doesn't matter. It's literally, they're like, my number one biggest thing is I can't hire enough great people. And so it seems pretty obvious to them if they are not seen as being a welcoming and inclusive culture and people look at the website and say, well, if the leadership team, you know, they can say whatever they want, but if the leadership team and the boards look a certain way, they're probably not getting, you know, the candidate pipeline that they want. And if they're missing out on half of the population um, or, or more, uh, it makes it even harder for them to do their job. So, it has really moved from being sort of, I would say, almost defensive, like like felt like they were on the defensive, to like this is like a offensive in a positive way strategy, meaning like, hey, if I'm going to go out there and cast the widest net for great people, whether that's in Silicon Valley, and obviously most of my companies have locations in, in many places throughout the world, wherever they are, they know that that they see that if they can figure it out and crack the code, that it's a real advantage for them. Mm. Um, so that's heartening to see. Um, if you look at the numbers, they're like small percentage point increases, so it's going to take a really long time to get there. But I'm sure some really clever entrepreneur, and actually you talked about some of the technology that's being applied. I do actually think that those are some interesting places to either, to both reach out and tap more people who wouldn't normally apply to venture-backed yeah. companies, and then also get them through the funnels further. Um, so, you know, machine learning can be used for bad or for good. Or for good, yeah. Um, and I think maybe should we open it up for, for questions? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. <coughs> right. Can we get this working out? Okay. Can we just open up for questions? I just wanted to just pose one sort of question beforehand. If we look in this part of the world, Cape Town, We've got Amazon's got a huge operation up the road here. That at the end of every year, they go to the universities and they soak up 60, 70 percent of all the graduates. How are startups and smaller businesses going to be able to get the skills that they require for um, to actually build and develop? Yeah. So um, one of our investees, Andela, um, is actually trying to solve this problem and teaching. Instead of just looking at universities as pipeline, they're teaching folks who've never learned how to code, uh, how to code from scratch. It's a very competitive process, uh, very well structured and thought through. A mix of tech and in-person learning, huge success. In fact, now the big problem is a lot of the Andela graduates are being sucked up in Europe uh, and other parts of the world. So we're like, that. I mean, and the US. US. Yes. I know we have a lot of companies <laughs> that use them. Which is great for them, and hopefully they'll do well and come back and invest. Um, but I think there are creative ways of building up the talent pool that's not just around university learning, um, that's beginning to look at that problem. Um, 
and, and, and Della is, is, is doing a really good job at that. I think, you know, for me in particular as a woman, I've seen the, the growing numbers of women then getting into tech and coding and, and how a lot of us are focused on keeping them in the pipeline because that's the other challenge is they might go and learn and, but not get frustrated or have a really bad sort of uh, experience in a male-dominated space and drop out. So there's a lot also about not just graduating the talent but keeping them there, but it's very competitive. Um, and maybe it's, a, it's, it's, it's an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Ori, I'm sorry I don't know you, but I know Teresa pretty well, and you're one of the more humble people I know. Um, while you're so successful, maybe you can share with us a little about your background. How did you get here? And how do you give back? How does that manifest itself in your mentoring entrepreneurs and mixing that with your investing strategy? Okay, thanks, Chuck. Uh, so I'll try to be really brief. So um, while this is my uh, first visit to South Africa, I was actually, um, I was born in Jakarta, Indonesia, um, to Chinese uh, ethnic parents. We left the country uh, during the revolution in the late 60s, came to the United States, grew up in a really small town outside of Buffalo, New York, population 2000, no stoplights. Um, uh, went to university at Brown University, which is how I got connected with Chuck Davis, uh, and uh, have an engineering degree from there came out to the Silicon Valley to go to graduate school at Stanford Business School. And then shortly after, uh, Stanford joined some classmates who had raised a million dollars of venture capital seed funding uh, in the mid-90s for a company that was doing electronic software distribution, payments, and downloads. We were a lot early uh, because we were designing things that could be downloaded on a 28.8K modem, for those of you who remember <laughs> AOL dial-up. Um, Anyway, so that helped raise three rounds of venture capital, and that is how, so not nearly as accomplished story, but I was once uh, an entrepreneur before joining what people would say is the dark side of venture capital, uh, and have been an investor ever since then. Um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, one of the early investors in several cybersecurity companies that have gone public, Four Scouts, the recent one that Ori was talking about, Imperva, one before that also a consumer internet company called Trulia in the real estate search, which is now combined with Zillow. And um, interestingly, my office, Aspect Ventures now, is in the same office where I went with a couple of my partners to give a 19-year-old guy named Mike, Mark Zuckerberg his Series A term sheet for Facebook. So those are some of the ones that maybe you've heard of more often. Um, anyway, that, that's my background. I feel very fortunate to have had those opportunities. I have tried to give back by mentoring, obviously, the companies that I'm fortunate enough to invest in. Uh, as we were saying, uh, over 40% of those happen to be female-founded, um, which wasn't the case when I was at an all-male firm, uh, even though I was one of the partners. Uh, and also through efforts like uh, Founders for Change and All Raise, as well as through uh, education and trying to encourage STEM education for women. Uh, I'm on the board at Brown University, and a lot of uh, the investments and, and philanthropic support that I've made for the university is around funding opportunities for uh, women in STEM, but also, generally speaking, for financial aid. Um, last year, Brown announced that um, there would be no more student loans, so students from Brown don't have to pay student, for student loans anymore through a thing called Brown Promise. Um, very briefly, the reason why that's so important to me personally is because I was one of those kids, um, and had it not been for my father being willing to uh, get a second mortgage on the house, I would have gone to some other, I'm sure probably also good school, but not as much fun. Hi, uh, my name is Lexi. I run Singularity Investments in Lagos, so no Ori as well. Uh, question for you both. Uh, I think that there's, for Ori, there's a perceived tech bubble in the U.S., uh, what happens if that comes to pass in terms of capital flows coming to emerging markets, especially Africa? Is that positive or negative? And for Teresa, um, what is the future? Is there a future of VC with alternative funding sources available like ICOs? Um, so I think a few years ago that would have had a bigger impact in Africa. Uh, but if I look at the venture dollars coming in, it's much broader now. So we're 
not as, as um, susceptible in terms of inflows, right? We're not as susceptible as, as we were a few years ago where a lot of the money coming in was impact driven from US companies or US uh, founders or US wealth. So you're seeing a lot more European money coming in, a lot more DFIs uh, coming in, putting in money into, into venture and, and obviously potentially India and China and Japan. Um, what it does do though, just in terms of perceptions of risk, already people feel it's a very risky space. Uh, and so any bubble implosion in the US just un undermines the hard work that some of us have been doing as far as educating the market in terms of the opportunities. So I think that's the potential risk that people feel. Let's just go back to brick and mortar because we, you know, tech is, is too risky. So I think that there is still a place for value-added venture capital. So, I mean, even before ICOs, there were um, crowdfunding sites like AngelList and others. So there are plenty of sources of capital. And as Ori was saying before, there are plenty of types of businesses that actually should see different capital structures and not venture capital. But if you are trying to create a technology-enabled business that is seeking to grow 10 or 100 times larger than where you are today, then I do think the right venture capital partner who shouldn't just be bringing money, but who actually wants to join your board and help you recruit those other executives to your company, help you navigate how to raise those middle, those tough middle stage rounds, whether that's from corporates or later stage VCs, I think there is still a place for that. And I still look at that and saying some of the hottest series A companies that have come through in the last year or so are still choosing to take venture capital as opposed to, you know, they could raise a lot more money, you're right, through an ICO, but what they would be missing if they didn't already have it is, you know, advisors, people who could be on their boards to help them navigate their, their future growth and fundraising rounds. But it has to be for the right reason. It's not right for every company. Um. Yeah, my question was triggered by um, by your comment about the potential of blockchain. That despite the crypto being down, that the platform and protocols have a big potential. So, two questions really uh, in that regard. Um, wh how, where do you see big opportunities in tokenization, and do you see big tokenization of assets being a big idea? And also, um, with the giants like Facebook and Amazon doing their coins, uh, crypto cryptocurrencies, and merging. Uh, in case of Facebook with the Messenger, do you see like a big thing opening up there with the Facebook and uh, Amazon and the others stepping into the crypto space? So I'll start with your second question. I'm not sure I caught the whole first question, but the second question in terms of like people actually issuing sort of consumer facing cryptocurrencies, if you recall, I think that the cryptocurrency piece of it is still fairly speculative, but yes, it's probably true that you, if you already have a large consumer brand and distribution platform, that's going to be harder for an upstart to compete against. But at the infrastructure level, when you think about what, so there's cryptocurrencies, which is just like any other currency, just happen to be based digitally. The underlying infrastructure, blockchain, just really all that means is people are pretty familiar with a centralized database. It's the opposite of that. So it's an ex incredibly distributed database where everybody along the chain holds a small immutable piece of information where until you can get all of that put together again, that's how you can verify that Ori owns this asset and doesn't have to be currency or another asset. So the places where I'm actually seeing it get some early uptake is actually in the enterprise. So it's being used for things you might think about. So supply chain, particularly highly regulated supply chains. So in food, which is, you know, in food safety, uh, which is relevant certainly in the United States as well it's as here, uh, as well as early days in healthcare, in product tracking for all of the inputs. So these are traditional enterprises that you know, the large um, distributors of the world, the McKessons and the Cardinals, as well as the um, drug and device manufacturing companies, and they are using the technology as a way to track things and share information. Today, they wouldn't be willing to share their corporate database information with one another because they're competitors, but because of the nature of blockchain, so these are the, and what I would say is, it is still really early. If, if crypto was uh, an 11 out of 10 in terms of hype last year before the, the volatility, blockchain is probably still a nine out of 10, and we're, we're maybe, we're at sort of stage two or three 
Um, but over time, I think it will be, it is being embraced by large Fortune 500s, so I see that it will happen. Nothing happens quickly with large enterprises, though. Yeah, um, I think we have a running joke for anyone receiving pitches in Africa right now, because it's like, XXX and now be the blockchain of something. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, but we are seeing opportunities the same. Uh, so Twiga, for instance, is looking at, uh, for agriculture, their produce. Food safety is a huge, huge issue. Uh, something they're very concerned about, but most Africans buy their food in informal markets. Actually, we talk about a huge opportunity that no one really studies and that startups should just spend their time studying informal markets. It looks like chaos. It's very organized. Lots of inefficiencies there. And businesses that are beginning to look at informal markets, I think, will do very well in Africa. But food safety is a challenge. So how do you verify the banana that you're buying on the street in Nairobi? You know, there's a lot of bad chemicals being used uh, to ripen them, et cetera, et cetera. And so tracking, like, Twigger's produce, you know, so if th there's an incident, uh, they know that this is our produce and we can account for it. It's huge. You're also seeing on the anti-corruption side, um, as governments are trying to return seized assets. So if you're Switzerland, mm. you Swiss, uh, you're returning a bachelor's money every year, it seems. His money never ends. How do you, how do you track, like, um, where, you know, and you said we're sending it back so you can use it to address, like, healthcare in Nigeria making sure that the money actually goes to do what it was supposed to do and not end up in someone else's pocket. There's big, there are early explorations in asset recovery, use of blockchain for that. The rest, uh, I'm not yet convinced. We've got time for one more question. Uh, okay, I've, um, I've got the mic and I... Okay, then the wind's finished just when. So we don't okay, the one question I've, um, my name's Andre, I'm from Johannesburg. I've been an early stage VC. We're moving into impact investing and talking especially to international impact investors about disruptive tech into Africa. And the question is, you know, the scale, the scale always comes up for Africa, right? So in the US, even if you don't get the first iteration of your product right or it, beats, it, it gets adopted differently, you can pivot because the market's deep. How do you convince international investors and how do you think about saying, okay, so there is disruptive tech which we see this and this application for in the US, for example, how that can apply into Africa and how that can scale into Africa? How would you answer the question about how do you make sure that the application is going to scale as you're envisaging it? Yeah, I think so educating them one on scale looks very different in our region. I think it's fine to educate them on that, that it's not, uh, not everything should scale in the same way that it does in the U.S. Um, is, is, is something I'm finding useful. Even uh, thinking about impact in very different ways. So, for instance, I would love if we thought about impact, not just X number of people reached, but rather how many sustainable wage jobs are you creating? Um, so less, like, did you touch you know, 10 million, because again, we're seeing a lot of crazy valuations and money being raised, not based on substance, and then they say, well, VC doesn't work in Africa, or impact investing doesn't work in Africa, because the fundamental analysis was wrong to start with. And so, I, I, I don't have an easy answer, but I think just educating people that the markets look very different, and that's fine. Uh, and the way we should think about impact is potentially different, not always about how many people are reached, but maybe, you know, are they selling? Are you revenue positive? Uh, are you creating impact in other ways that doesn't look like a billion numbers? Because that's been quite damaging. They're, very, they're only going to be so many Facebooks and Googles and, and you know, even M-Pesa scales, it hasn't scaled well in Africa, it's scaling very well in Asia. Uh, and so think about it differently, even innovation that doesn't scale in Africa but scales elsewhere. Ushahidi scaled globally. Uh, 100 and something countries scaled, didn't scale very well within Africa. Uh, and that's another way to think about it. How do our innovations scale in other markets? Not how do other innovations potentially scale in Africa? That makes sense. Hi. Um, it's a question related to um, the future of like the international companies. Like, if you look at the trade situation between China and US now, how, how do you, in terms of investment strategy, how do you look at like 
investing in a U.S. company that can actually serve in the two largest world economy and vice versa. Do you think that's still possible with the trade tension and also with the differences in the internet and the life lifestyle? Yeah. So uh, I, I would say in terms of technology investing, this is going to sound crazy. So I think that that's always been a challenge. I think the current trade tensions certainly makes it more front of mind for people. The reality is right now, the impediments, the tariffs that are in place are really on more traditionally manufactured goods. For US-based technology companies, this is not a political statement, it's just a fact, right? It's always been much harder for them to think about uh, penetrating the China market with, especially with a consumer technology or any technology that relied upon access to commercial internet in China. The requirements have always been, so this isn't new, this has been for at least the last 10 plus years since I've been paying attention to it, been a challenge. So for US, most of the US-based early stage venture capital firms that I know and my former firm was one of them, the thought of, you know, yes, it's a huge market, but in order to actually invest in it, you need to set up a local investment firm staffed locally with the right connections into Beijing and elsewhere and invest in China startups founded by Chinese nationals, invested in by Chinese nationals and so on and so forth. So the idea of doing cross-border or like investing in a US company that was gonna do well in China, that, that hasn't been I think in the playbook for at least a dozen years.